Good morning, everybody. This is Dennis Wilbur with the Active Trend Traders uh, for the How to Make Money Trading Stocks um, webinar. Uh, joining us today from Dallas, Texas is this guy here, Mike Traeger. And I um, had a good visit with Mike earlier this, uh, well, gosh, at the last part of the summertime and ate at a really awesome Mexican place with him, my wife, and his dog. And uh, so how you doing, Mike? Yeah, if if there's one thing we have in Texas, it's uh, good Tex-Mex food, right? Without a doubt, and that was a, a great place. Uh, I just love those little, you know, kind of like, they can be just hole-in-the-wall places, but they're really awesome. Anyway, we got a lot to cover today, so let's get going. And you said that you, you've got a uh, cold front co that came through and kind of cooled, cooled you guys down a little bit? Yeah, finally, it was about... You know, very pleasant fall type weather here now. Ah, cool. And uh, as I shared with you, yeah, the, the weather, the the seasons kind of changing over here in Hawaii. Also, it's uh, like currently it's uh, at eight o'clock in the morning. It's a brisk, seventy four degrees, and uh, people on the mainland always kind of find that silly when I say, you know, when it starts getting down below seventy, it gets it, it's cold here, simply because we have no heating. Um, as a one thing, and with the wind chill factor, with the wind blowing, you know, 10, 15 miles an hour, you know, with the wind chill, it gets down to like 62 degrees, Mike, and that's cold. I, I was going to say, you know, I didn't think that there was a change of season in Hawaii, <laughs> maybe just, you know, between rainy and, and not rainy. Now, you can always tell the locals, if you ever come here during the wintertime uh, on vacation, you can always tell the locals, locals uh, during the winter months, because they're the ones that will be out where, you know, with their shorts on and their slippers on, but they'll be wearing a jacket because they're 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 cold. And so, I want to remind everybody that all the materials we present is for training purposes only. Traders should always paper trade any new method prior to the risk of their own personal capital. Michael Bischoff is not with us today. Uh, he's probably trying to get the, the last little bit. He Michael likes to do his holidays, and so he's not with us today. So. Uh, we've been having some awesome training sessions uh, with the Active Trend Trainer over the last uh, few, gosh, last two months. We have built a s tremendous foundation for the premium members um, and also uh, those who watch the recordings uh, that basically uh, a terrific foundation, one, for your day-to-day -day trading or week-to-week -week trading and also uh, so that you can be better prepared and uh, more confidence in, in where to take your, your potential trades and this type of thing. So uh, that's been going well. This week we, we basically cover preparing for the year end. Now, and we'll talk a little bit about year end as we get review the uh, uh, charts. And then I got a really great email this week from uh, uh, that basically just thanks and thank me for the training that he's you know, that we give and how he thinks it's improved his trading. So let's get into the market update for the 21st. Um, as we were talking last week, I didn't have any comments down here last week regarding the S&P, the NASDAQ. The Russell only said that it's the most fearful of the indexes simply because um, the pending rate hike that will probably take place in December by the Fed. So um, as I'm looking at this week, I'm seeing that, that stocks seem to still be in this holding pattern. Um, the S and you know, but you know, but even though it's been in a holding pattern, there have been you know nice you know good opportunities on individual stocks and some of the ETS for real quick runs, and and it's been basically you get in. And, and have your conditional orders ready to get you out and, and you have to take your profits sometimes at you know three and a half to seven percent and you keep in a real tight stop loss and so that's been working fairly well over the last several weeks since the market's been in this uh, kind of sideways to slightly down trajectory. S&P no traction. NASDAQ strongest of the uh, trading indexes. Russell actually came down about, I think it was the 100-day 100, 100 moving average, uh, and it did hold there, but what's next, you know? What's next? How it rebounds off of that would be telling. And so uh, there's been a lot of outside influences, uh, Mike. The, the debate, on, the uh, presidential debate, uh, the news and noise that came from that, 
didn't move the market whatsoever, um, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but the, the U.S. elections are coming up. World economies are, um, it seems like we're getting a continuous uh, siege of bad news from the world economies, uh, especially out of Europe, out of, out of China. Um, and some of the other things that are leading the way, you know, Fed posturing for the potential December rate hike. Um, I don't think that they will touch the rates in November, which is coming up the first week in November. Um, uh, it's too close to the election, and uh, I think they don't want to upset the apple cart. And then earnings are underway, and we're beginning a, a – uh, the stocks the, with a really great earnings and great expect, you know, projections, such as Netflix, uh, have been doing exceptionally well and others have been getting hammered uh, when they've missed. One of the things I found interesting, Mike, this past week is Microsoft apparently busted out some really great earnings, and on IBD, Microsoft was actually elevated back into, potentially back into the upper echelon of some of their, their, uh, uh, their list, and, and I just, I, boy, you know, wouldn't it be amazing if Microsoft turned back into a growth stock? Yeah, I, I, I don't see that happening. But, you know, re recently there has been so me some momentum in, in uh, that stock price. And, you know, IBD is very much a momentum type methodology. Yeah. And once the stock gets going, it, it comes to the top of the IBD list. Um, you know, if you really read the earnings report on Microsoft, it wasn't as good as the headline number. Oh. Only because, you know, you get into the difference between GAAP and non-GAAP uh, numbers and, and reports on, you know, earnings and revenues. You know, the non-GAAP number looked pretty good, but the GAAP number was kind of ugly. And um, <clears throat> Microsoft, you know, the market cap there is just too large in my mind, for it to make the kind of run that it made in the 80s and 90s. It's yeah. just too big a stock. But for now, um, you know, some people who might have bought Microsoft in 1999 or 2000 are probably happy because now the stock is right back where it was 16 or 17 years ago. Yeah, yeah. And, and people who bought then are, you know, can now say they're, they're even. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And so uh, the big question mark that's out there is the U.S. elections. Um, what are you sensing? Is, what do you think is going to happen after the election? Okay. Uh, we kind of had a little chat before, uh, before we got started today about that particularly. Uh, yeah, I think we're both in agreement if Trump gets elected that uh, – Oh, if Trump – if Trump gets elected, you know, the, the markets are going to dump. It, it, there, I don't think there is much – question yeah. about that. I think the only question would be, you know, what might the markets do if Hillary gets elected? And, yeah, and that's kind of a crapshoot, I think. I mean, they, they might rally. You might get the short-term, you know, kind of knee-jerk reaction to the upside. And, um, or, you know, it's certainly possible that, uh, you know, four years of Hillary will be like, you know, four more years of Obama. And, um, n nobody's terribly, you know, thrilled with that prospect either. So, yeah. um, well, there are a few people, hard, with, there are a few right. people, there are a few people, there are some people out there that are very thrilled with it. Um, I mean, it's, well, her family, her yeah. family is, her family. Yeah. Bill, Bill, Bill you know, <laughs> never mind. We're not going to go there. Uh, anyway, uh, I I basically agree. I think that the real connection there is that whatever the reaction, it'll be kind of a Brexit type reaction after the election, either one way or the other. But I think that the the essence is is that at the end of the year, um, the market has already been given us you know telegraphing their signals regarding potential increases in in the. Uh, Fed rate and the interest rate, and that if that in fact happens, the market is is, is at least from the um, telegraph signals that is sent out so far is the market's not going to like even a quarter point increase um, 
you know, moving forward. And so that could be interesting. Uh, one of our members really sent me a really great link for an article that was posted by IBD. And apparently, uh, Clinton has been discussing with the big banks the concept of nationalizing, this is in the U.S. only, nationalizing the uh, our 401ks for us and our IRAs. <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, gosh. And, well, okay. And, uh, you know, if anybody wants that link, it was in the, pa it was in the paper, I think, uh, either yesterday or the day before in the IBD uh, paper. And, but, yeah, they're talking about the, you know, and they're talking with the, the Wall Street guys about uh, how are you going to manage everybody's me money because we, the people, are too stupid to do it ourselves. Well, um, it, it, she's, she's pretty connected with Wall Street, and, and something like that would be a big boon for Wall Street because they'll get their management fees off of a, a huge base of assets. Yeah, you know, all yeah. the people who have money, IRAs and 401ks and, and, and you know, pension plans, uh, I, I mean, the management fee, just the management fees on that could be, you know, billions a year for Wall Street. Yeah. However, um, we, we see how the government has managed the Social Security situation. Oh, exactly. And, and the Social Security Trust Fund, which is on the brink of insolvency. And, and, um, and you think that they're going to do it any better with a bigger asset base to manage? Um, I think that would be a disaster, although the people on Wall Street would love it. And well, I know I feel comfortable with the IOU that the government has given me for my, uh, uh, my um, Social Security. Um, but you know what's really interesting is uh, all government workers uh, participate in what's called a thrift savings plan, and, uh, which is you know, managed by you know, Wall Street firms uh, for the government. And um, like the Social Security Trust Fund, the government has done the same thing with those people. And that's military people, that's, that's uh, government workers and all kind of stuff. They contribute, like a 401k, into this thing called Thrift Savings Plan. And um, the government has already rated that to take cash out and replaced it with IOUs. And uh, so I, I'm I'm just very thankful. My wife is already retired from the government. So and and as soon as we got retired, we actually took all of her funds out of her TSP, put it into an individual IRA, uh, you know, that we control that that the government doesn't have its fingers in. So percentage of stock above their 20-day moving average. Uh, here's where we were last week. We were bouncing down towards the 30 level. Uh, this week we did get a a close on Monday down below it, but both Mike and I have been looking at this and this, uh, we had no other uh, of our uh, proprietary indicators saying, hey, it was a good time to, to go along the market. And I think we're seeing that uh, at, at least at this point, that was a wise uh, decision not to go along anything in the market simply because it's, it's sputtering. There's no traction. So today we have, we popped up a little bit uh, after, you know, early in the week, but we're kind of stuck in this range. Now, you know, for those of you who aren't aware of this, Mike and I use this indicator to at least give us a, 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 a early, well, basically a pre-early warning on our early warning alert system. And we like to see it when it gets down into these levels below, you know, actually below, you know, below 30, but when it gets down between 25 and 15 or even lower, that usually triggers our other proprietary uh, indicators into saying, hey, it's a good time to be buying. So anything you see here, Mike, that uh, at this point, other than no changes since Wednesday when we talked about it last? No, I really have nothing to add to what you just said. And, yeah, there's just nothing actionable here at this point right now in in my mind. And so, okay. And so Barry asked, uh, to get the 20 SMA off barchart.com, do you need a subscription? Um, I don't think so, Barry, because I can, I can go into bar chart and have any, you can, you can, it allows you to add certain uh, moving averages and, um, and so in the, in the chart that I look at normally would have, has I think the 20 day moving average on it and, um, 
or maybe it was the eight-day moving average. I think it's the eight-day moving average that I uh, imported into it. But a lot, and that's part of the free free stuff. So yeah, you don't need a subscription to get this, and, and I do believe that it periodically updates intraday. Yes. Uh, although you, you know, certainly it lags. And then what's the lag, Dan? It's about thirty minutes or so. Yeah. Well, actually, yeah, it's about twenty to thirty minutes. It lags, but uh, it gives you a pretty good picture of you know where thing you know where things are at during the day. And uh, yeah. yeah. And you know, believe me, you don't need this information in real time. It, it's not that time sensitive. You know, what's really funny is, you know, we talk about nowadays, you know, well, gosh, there's a 20 minute lag. We want to have like real time data and real time information. And uh, back in the day of Jesse Livermore, their lag time was sometimes a week uh, because or, 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 you know, hours at least if they were getting things from a telegraph, you know, off the telegraph, the ticker tape, if you will. And so interesting. So, uh, here's where the markets were at about nine o'clock this morning. As you can see, the uh, the S and P is really flirting with dropping back below its you know high from 2015. Um, it is you know things things are you know tracking around, and we made a comment on. Uh, on Wednesday night uh, at the training session is that the it's really interesting the S and P. Um, the Nasdaq and the Russell, in reality, for the, where it's where we started the year and fell from, you know, it's doing pretty good to be up, you know, almost five percent on all of those. Russell's actually up seven percent for the year, uh, but the year's not done yet, and so we'll see where we finish off uh, as we move into the end of the year. Let's take a look at the charts. Hopefully, that's the S and P. Um, I've highlighted earlier how the S&P is working within, of course, this larger FIB, and it is contained for about a month and a half now since the since the uh, uh, first part of September it has contained all of the 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 movement basically in that area. It has been favoring over the last several days. Uh, over the last you know couple of weeks, the lower lower side of this, and then of course you have your fib box in the middle, which is three eight two to six one eight retracement, and so there's a lot of things going on in this chart that are both I would say the the indicate the indications are mixed, in that we have uh, a crosses of the eight twenty crossed up here around uh, the first part of September, or no, the first part of uh, October. And then shortly after that, we crossed below the, the 50. And so each of these moving averages now could uh, act as a level of resistance against any potential upward surge in the market. Um, and then, of course, the individual FIB uh, lines can also serve as that same thing. We've got some, you know, we had a, a positive turn off the bottom on the true strength indicator on the daily. The the uh, momentum is, you know, it's setting up, it's moving sideways, which is what the market has been doing. And we get see today with today's uh, price or with this week's price that price action so far, the well the TSI weekly wise just dropped below the zero line, which tends to say, hey, I'm you know, may go into a longer term downtrend. And, um, you know, uh, and the, but, but the momentum has kind of ticked up a little bit. And so I find that kind of interesting. Um, no, there, there's no positive divergence that we're looking at uh, at this particular point here. Or, you know, there was a little bit between here and here on the true strength indicator between this low and this low. Um, and a little bit on also on the momentum, but right now, as we've said, is the is the uh, the S and P just appears to be in a holding pattern, and and it it's defined by this box here, and uh, and we're still getting the nice daily swings, Mike, that are that are in this case like the range of today was about ten points, and so. Anything, anything you got going for the uh, off of that you, that you want to pull off of this, Mike? 
No, not really. Not unless you want to draw another triangle on the chart. But but the triangle that I'm thinking of or visualizing this time would be, uh, um, you know, a descending line coming down across the lower highs and then a horizontal line right around 2120 uh, where, where that support area is. Okay. There's one. And then we'll just use that this support area here. Let me get rid of the fibs really quick. And then we've got this line going across here, basically. There you go. Yeah, so you know, we have a pretty strong support area there, which has been tested several times the past few weeks and held. But certainly, you know, over the past, gosh, a uh, couple months now, uh, a series of lower highs in place. Yep. And at, at some point, you know, something's going to break. Uh, I mean, either the price action will break out to a higher high uh, above that line or will break down below, you know, the horizontal support. And we can make projections uh, as to where price might go on those kinds of breakouts. Um, you know, when it happens. I'm not even going to say if it happens yeah, because well, sooner, or later, sooner or later it's going to happen one way or the other. And and um, that's about the only observation I think I can make that you haven't made already. Yeah, and uh, there's a projection to the downside based on that, that existing uh, triangle. Um, it may be a little bit deeper than that like down here to the 12, uh, 2040, because I could also take this from this high down to here. Uh, but what I find very interesting, that's a 6% correction from the highs. And, you know, if we get back around the 200-day um, moving average, it'd be about a 5% correction. And so that, in reality, would help flush a lot of the surplus out of the market if we did get something like that. Uh, and then we would get a, you know, hopefully get set up for a healthier rebound moving into, you know, move, you know, moving forward. Because, uh, you know, I think we, you know, I think that since this big bull market is still, you know, like still going on over, you know, over seven years old, a healthy reset would be good for us uh, in, in, uh, in a longer term and give us a, a wonderful opportunity like, and who knows, that opportunity may come. Uh, in December, January time frame if the Fed does raise rates and the market does choose to correct. So, so that's what we got for the NASDAQ, or for the S&P. NASDAQ, wow, let's put up the NASDAQ. Here we go, NDX. There we go. As we can see, uh, NASDAQ is basically working, in, you know, much more healthy. It has pulled back up above the 820 combo. Um, who know, you know, are we going to go on and push back up to these highs? This particular upswing here is, is can be possibly very indicative because we've got a couple of things going on here. And one of them is that we've got, you know, you can connect these lows here. And so as long as prices stay up above those lows, we should continue up. Um, the, uh, but that's a, a support level. We also have the support level down here just at the 50-day uh, moving average. Uh, if that is, in fact, if, this, if we get up here and get reversal signals prior to getting up to four, uh, or anywhere between where it's at right now and the 4,900 level, uh, that may constitute a lower high on a daily basis, and uh, so that's what I'm saying. This move up uh, should be very, you know, sh it will be very telling as we get closer into the, the end of the year. Um, similar type of uh, uh, comments, we got a nice move up on the TSI. The momentum, as you can see, is moving sideways which is not telling is basically telling us we have you know while this is index is moving back up does not have a lot of traction we still have the momentum on a weekly chart pointing down and it it appears as if we may be getting we've got the TSI on the weekly chart pointed down 
but it looks like we may be putting in a squeeze uh, where it squeezes back into the short, shorter term line, our longer term line, and um, we'll see what transpires from there. Uh, but as you can see, we did have some negative divergence on a weekly on the TSI, where made it, we were having a, a high there, made a higher high, but the TSI made a lower uh, a lower high. And those are things that we just file away and go, okay, are the clues starting to add up that we may get a, uh, a correction moving forward? Um, and again, and I like to take, and I, uh, when I do this kind of stuff, and I like to project both with the, with both from the uh, uh, Fibonacci's, but also I'll just, you know, project down, you know, for a 5% correction. Well, that would put us back where we were one, two, three, four, five, six weeks ago. Um, so, anyway, anything on the NASDAQ, Mike? Um, no, nothing that you haven't covered. Uh, my only thought is, you know, last week we had uh, on the weekly chart a pretty bearish engulfing candlestick. Yes. And in the middle of last week we had that big down day, uh, which shows on the daily chart. Right here. And those candlesticks... Uh, have very bearish implications, and because you know the high, you know the high point of those candlesticks has still not been you know breached. Uh, I think they are still influential. That's true. And uh, will will continue to be until and unless you, you know those previous highs are taken out, um, especially so on, on the weekly chart. And so, yeah, that Mike. What Mike's talking about is this bearish candle engulfed, you know, this week plus this week plus this week, got a little bit into this week, but it engulfed three weeks worth of effort to move higher. And this candle, while it is an up candle for the week, is still working within the confines of this bearish engulfing candle here. So as far as a, you know, a, a, a negative signal, that is still a valid signal, the, the candlestick that is right there. Good call. Right, which is my point. So, Russell. Russell. There we go. Okay, Russell. Russell basically has fallen down, as I said, to the 100-day moving average. Uh, there is a level of support in that area. Let's just draw it across to approximately there, where it's coming down. But it's also, here's the 100-day moving average. So let's say just a 1207 level at a zone of, of resistance support over here from an earlier breakout. Uh, for the week, what I find kind of interesting, Mike, is that for the week, we may be putting in a hammer-like uh, candlestick, which tends to be a reversal signal. And on the weekly chart, at least as, as of right now, it's almost putting in like an inverted hammer at a level of support, which also can be, can, it has been defined as being a reversal signal also. Um, however, the, um, both of these, uh, you know, we are basically confined within you know, about the 1260 level down to the 1207 level. And while that, and so as we, you know, as we do move back up, you also have this level here, which constitutes a down, you know, downtrending um, um, aspect here. And so you'll have a level of a resistance in here um, that could, you know, be, the reversal point, the 8 is dropped below the 10, uh, 50. It appears as if the 20 wants to drop below the 50. Um, but on occasions, you know, you get a nice bounce and, and it rips right back through those moving averages and as, as they uh, uh, fail to provide resistance as you would anticipate them doing. And when that happens, I, I just go back to the, the horizontal levels of resistance and support throw in a trend line and, and uh, but, but 
overall the levels of the horizontal support and resistance are the ones that I believe are, well, it's been shown technically that they are the strongest. So that's what we've got going on on the uh, Russell. Um, if I were to, you know, plan a trade around the IWM or um, uh, the IWM or its counterpart TNA, which is a three-time um, leverage, I would I would look at uh, our three times, uh, yeah, leverage index ETF for the uh, Russell. Um, look look to keep. You know, you want to be taking profits fairly quickly. If you get up, you know, 10, 15 percent on TNA, that's a great time to say, "Hey, I'm I'm done with this." Until the market has developed some traction, going either one way or the other. Question: Does the Russell historically do better in the last months of the year? Historically, Mike, remember when we did our back testing? Usually, you get a nice little pop in the Russell during the the last part of the last part of the year. However, uh, as we saw last year, it didn't happen. Uh, primarily, and I, yeah, go ahead, Mike. No, well, you know, nothing's 100%. It, it doesn't happen every year, year in and year out, you know, with the regularity of a clock. However, the answer to the question is yes. Uh, typically between the months of October or November and March to April, the Russell does fairly well historically uh, and that has held for you know 35 or 40 years that doesn't mean it happens every year but it might happen 90 percent of the time you know over a 40-year period and there is a, uh, a methodology a trading methodology which worked really well in back testing going back you know yeah. Going back to the to the mid 70s up until a few years ago, where you would just buy the IWM like on the first of October and hold it until the the end of March, and over a 35 year period, that was a huge excuse me that was a huge money maker. It hasn't held up as well the past few years, but to answer the question generally historically, yes, the Russell does pretty well. In, in the latter months of the year, and uh, the first couple months at least of the uh, new year. Yep. And so, um, and then here's CNA is the three-time leverage of the uh, IWM or, or the Russell, and basically if it gets back up to the moving averages, it's about a two point about a three point seven percent gain. If it gets up, depending on when it gets up to the uh, trend line, that's about a, about another 4.93 percent. If it rebounds from the 72 level and rebounds all the way back up here into the previous highs, you're talking about 11 percent, you know, 11 percent move. And so that's what I'm talking about. It's it's it is confined within a box, and so at the top of the box, or or even you know, sometimes you may get the crease in the box. That's where you'd want to be jumping on on potential profits until we get a more solidified actual trend. Uh, Joe asked real quick, let's see, remove drawings, there we go. Um, the, Joe, I don't follow uh, per se the XLE, which is I think the, um, that is the... It's an, it's an energy ETF, yeah, it's I energy, believe. Yeah, energy ETF. And part of the reasons why I don't follow it is it, is it it doesn't move as much as I, I, you know, some of the things I would like, you know, that I like to trade. Uh, but, you know, it's been a nice little upswing almost for the whole year of, uh, of, of 2016. Here is the beginning of 2016, and it's gone into a nice little uptrending channel. And here's the uptrending channel basically from here. to eh, let's say there and as long as that channel remains in, a, in effect a person can in fact look to buy towards the bottom of the channel it's right in the middle of the channel right now um, but buy towards the bottom of the channel and you can either take profits at the top of the channel how big is the channel that is a you know it's about a 9.73 uh, uh, percent wide channel 
which which is not you know which is not bad and and it does ricochet up against it fairly well. And then the XLF, which I think is the X, uh, XLF for financials. Um, it, as you can see, since, uh, gosh, going back to 2014, has been kind of sideways. Uh, it may be in a, in a restart and bounce back up. It, so, Mike, if the Fed increases interest rates, should the financials go up? You know that's a good that's a good question uh, in in my mind because there has been some concern in the financial world uh, with, with all of this you know, the, the you know the low interest rates and the zero interest rates and even the negative interest rates that a lot of the banks you know the big money center global banks are hurting very badly because their profit margins are getting squeezed because right. of the interest rate situation. So if interest rates were to increase, certainly a case could be made for expecting financial stocks to, to go on a little bit of a rally because it might, you know, help to increase their profit margins a little bit right. and make them, um, you know, marginally more profitable. And, you know, the, the you know, the, the computers that are, you know, watching all this stuff uh, might look upon that favorably and, and start rallying those prices. Yeah. But so. then again, you know, if interest rates go up and the whole market wants to tank, you know, the financial stocks are probably going to go with it. So it, it's hard to project which way that might go. I think a case could be made either way. Yeah. And, and Joe, if I were, if, if I were to be trading, uh, like the <clears throat> financials, I'd be looking hard right here at FAS, which is your three time leverage of the financials on a weekly basis. It's just coming off the, uh, 40 week moving average, which no 20 week moving average, which equates approximately to the 100 day moving average. And it's busted back up through the 50 as we see it doing over here. Um, and when it's when it went on its run earlier this this year in from June, as you can see, this three time leverage had a nice move back up to from Keltner to Keltner of about 47 percent. So uh, this is a very liquid entity. It trades um, on average about oh uh, 2.8 million shares per day. And so I would be looking here. It looks like it is trying to do something constructive here. It, it you know, came down and bounced off the 100. And, um, and if it runs from here to here, you know, back up to resistance is about a 6.4, 6.6% opportunity. If it, if it basically did a, um, uh, you know, we're looking for, uh, uh, Symmetry. If it's a, a symmetrical move from here to here, and this was the low here, and you could project up that much, that would put it up. You know, uh, gosh, up in the. Well, let's just do this real quick. If it did a symmetrical type move, you can move this up, activate it. That's assuming that this is the the low of the swing low here. Um, and so that would put you up about the 38 level, but you'd need to get through these other levels of 35 before, let's see if we have any. That would put it up at an all-time new high. But, uh, but it is, you know, uh, it appears to be coming off of a pullback to a moving average and is doing a bounce. And again, if it had symmetry with this move from here to here, then you're probably going to look at, at uh, you know, somewhere about $35. Could I make possibly a more practical suggestion sure. uh, for the people listening in? You know, when we look at charts like this and we, you know, we draw these lines and then we draw the fib retracements and we draw this and we draw that. But, you, you know, if you're working all day and you're not sitting in front of this, but you want to know how to use the charts and, and how to use the information better. Um, you know, there are times, and we're going through a time like that right now, where the markets are trading in a very narrow range between pretty well established levels of support and resistance. You know, on this particular chart for FAS, 
FAS, excuse me, you can see now for a period, especially if you look at the weekly chart, I, I mean, for months, you know, this entity has been finding support right around $28 a share. And every time it comes down to 20, it might push down to 27.50 or something like that. But, you know, nothing really much more than that. So, so how do you use that information? You know, when you, you can't be sitting in front of your computer and, and, and entering an order in the middle of the day. Well, the way to use that information might be to say, well, okay, um, I really would like to buy this thing at $28 a share. So put an order in with your broker, which uh, I know with Schwab at least, you know, those orders are good for 60 days. Say, I want to buy FAS at, you know, 28 a share or 28.10 or 27.80 or, you know, whatever number you want to pick yeah. and let the order sit there. And if it comes down to 28 dollars, which is a proven level of support on this, you're going to get filled, even if you don't happen to be in front of it at that time. And uh, once filled, you might say, well, you know, it pretty reliably runs back up to about 30. So I'm going to take my profits at 30 or, you know, 29.75 or, or, or whatever the, the, you know, the number you're comfortable with. And, you know, with this, that's about, seven. You know, I'm going to say about a 7% move from, from 28 to 30. And um, 6 or 7%. And, and, you know, this thing has been making that move on a weekly basis for several weeks in a row. Yeah. And so in, in my mind, you know, that's one way to use the information that is on the chart and that we talk about. I mean, if we go back to the IWM chart, that level of support was around 72. Right. And you can put the order in to buy, um, or it was TNA, I think. I'm sorry. Yeah, it was TNA. Yeah, you can put the order in to buy TNA at, say, you know, 72. And, and if it gets filled while you happen to be away from your desk or your computer, then, you know, you own TNA at 72. You know, you might want to take profits at 74 or 75. But if you can do that, you know, on a weekly basis, three, four, five, six weeks in a row, you know, you're doing okay. Start, and Go ahead. that's, you know, I, I think one way to use the information, if you're working full time, um, but you want, you, you want to participate, um, certainly putting those orders in and just letting them sit out there. Uh, so that you get filled while you're away from things is the way to do it. Yeah. In a situation like that, you could, you know, Mike, I mean, I absolutely agree. You know I'm a big proponent of conditional orders just as, like you were talking about. Where would you put your stop? That's a great question. You could put your stop in a couple of places. One, you could just say, okay, uh, what's the low there? This swing low, it's, 20, uh, it's 27.58. I can say, well, you know, I'm going to give it 50 cents because if I buy at 28, um, it would be less than a 3% move, a 3% loss if I put my stop at 27. And so that would work out fine. And Mike, it's 7.14%. Right. <laughs> okay. Right. I was doing the arithmetic off the top of my head. Not good or, you know, as far as stop losses are concerned, you, you can say, well, all right, you know, the market's kind of quiet. I don't really expect to make more than 5 or 6% on anything, and I want a 2 to 1, you, you know, reward to risk ratio. Yeah. And if, I, if 5 or 6% is my upside, then, you know, 2 or 3% is going to be my downside. And, and so that's your stop loss. Let's say you get filled at 28 and you put a 3% stop loss on that. Well, you, you know, 3% off of 28 is about 84, 85 cents. You put right. your stop loss in around 27, 20, 27, 15. And, you know, that sound, sounds like a pretty narrow range, but, you know, that's the range that that entity is trading in right now, yeah. and uh, you, you limit your risk to get you know your potential seven percent reward up to about you know the thirty dollar level. Yeah, and those two different ways, you know, the the way you mentioned, Dennis, is one way. You know, use the recent swing low, or use a percentage stop loss exactly. depending on you know the risk reward ratio you're comfortable working with. 
Um, yeah. E either way, there's yeah. not big risk involved. Yeah, because I use a combination of both. Is one is I'll use a combination. I see where the swing low is, and then if you know. I know that that could be a potential level of support, and if below the swing low is, let's say, a 5% loss, well, what I'll do is I'll, uh, I will see what a full position, how much, you know, I, I know how much I can lose, which I typically put in there as top as 4%. But if, my, but if my swing low is 5%, I will adjust the number of shares I buy so that if I hit that stop loss, I never lose more than what I would have lost without a four percent of a full, full, uh, a full position. So great stuff, you know. And I'm glad you brought this up, Mike. Before, uh, Mike, I'm glad you brought this up because before uh, I was, you know, processing and thinking through, you know, what to cover on today's uh, webinar. One of the things I, I wanted to cover or just mention was sometimes in trading, it's a process of just getting in the way for a potential move up and um, as long as you're you know and so that's a lot of times what this planning is is that there are no perfect entries there are no necessarily perfect exits you live by your rules and then the, you know if you're you know using a good system and a good strategy it will get you in the way when things turn and do well. So we got to move along because because I got a, 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 the next webinar coming up in about 12 minutes. So uh, Joe just mentioned really quickly the large bank money center, the large money center banks just reported all reported well even Wells Fargo. <laughs> yeah, Wells Fargo is a whole different deal. And so, so uh, and, and I don't expect this earnings report to reflect the, the actual damage that's going to happen there eventually. Yeah, and so uh, passive least resistance. I think for at least for the interim time, are you still in the sideways mode, Mike? Yep. Short term. No, I, I don't. See, yeah, you know, short term. I don't see any any other um, yeah. position to um, you, you know try to support. And uh, and I think it's a toss up either way. For the health of the market, I would like to see a five, you know, percent or more correction. But that's what I'm hoping for, and it hasn't come to to fruition yet. Okay, here's where we're basically at at the end of this at the end of this week. Uh, we're moving along very nicely. I've got about fourteen hundred dollars to make up next week uh, uh, to get up back on the equity curve that will put us to a, you know my forty percent objective for the year. And um, strategy one is now up one point five percent. Whoops! I don't want to do that. I want to do this. So here's one of the trades we did earlier this week. Are actually on on the 13th, and this is a, one of our strategy one setups for a pre-earning trade. We went long, more or less, utilizing the same thing that Mike and I were just talking about. We put it in, in an order to buy down here, bouncing off the 150-day uh, moving average. We got into the trade on 10:13 at approximately $40.60. There was a Fibonacci that was sitting here right at 41.95. We knew I knew that that Fib would would potentially cause some resistance and there's a tendency for things to stop. So I basically put in a stop, uh, uh, a profit T1 at 41.95 when it's actually sold half the position. And because of the, the, the craziness of the market, I have been doing partial positions primarily, which is basically, and so, uh, but anyway, we sold that out, and then uh, for a one point uh, for at forty one ninety nine, uh, and then I'm waiting for T two, which is somewhere between five percent and fifteen percent. Uh, Grub is currently up a little bit over five. I'm I'm uh, I have my target in there at forty three forty. Uh, partial profit so far one eighteen. BMO uh, earnings before market opens on the 26th, which means I will be closing this position by the end of the market on 1025. 
And so uh, here's the, the most recent strategy three trade that we put on, which was Nugget. We opened it on 916, which was the middle of, uh, of September. And currently we have been tracking, I need to bring in about 190 dollars to two hundred dollars per week this week we did we sold three contracts and brought in hundred eighty dollars and you know in a a month the the overall position is up ten percent if you want to know more about strategy three you can go to this place to uh, see a recording training webinar on that and I think it is open to everybody uh, future presentations if you know who Lee Tanner is, a great IBD trader, he will be doing a presentation on November 5th, uh, then training on Wednesday night, prepping for year end. Uh, we have now, you know, updated for premium members, you know, how to do strategy three, timing entries and more, uh, active trading, trading and movement, uh, improvements. Uh, this week I started sending out pre-pre-market uh, alerts. Uh, for the folks so that try to take it you know take um, attempting to get the alerts out early enough I'm doing them primarily before I go to bed here in Hawaii which is about nine or ten o'clock which is way early in the morning on the East Coast and that way you have them when you wake up uh, thank you Karen I'm glad those alerts are working well and then the final hour trading which we're going to go to in about five minutes so if Sorry for rushing through. Here's the five pillars that the active trend trading system is based on. We, I believe that you have to have a strong system in place, and then we've added to this three strategies. And uh, I have 70% of my funds here, 10% here, and uh, 20 to 25% of my funds over here. And uh, if, you know, for people who want to follow the Active Trend Trading System, become a member, you don't have to follow all three strategies. You just wait for the trades to come up in the strategy you want to follow. So, Mike, that's all I've got for today. We covered a lot of stuff. And uh, I want to thank you for joining because I've got to get to the, to the next webinar. But, guys, see you next week. Um, let your friends know that this is a free webinar, and we cover some very valuable stuff as uh, uh, for learning how to trade. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have Mike join us. Um, and so if you're a premium member, the final hour follows in about five minutes. So if you have questions about stocks, please send me an email at, here's my address over here and I'll be glad to respond to him. So Mike, have a great weekend, buddy. Yeah, thanks, you too, I'll talk to you soon. Okay, God bless everybody. Oh. Bye. See ya.